is yet another episode of The Facts. And uh, this is a discussion episode. The Facts, we have music and we have discussions about different things. And, and this tonight we have a discussion uh, about music with uh, two composers, two very fine composers, and um, Benito Marcus and um, John McGuire. And um, so uh, sort of calling this thing you know, I don't know what it's going to actually be called, but the, the role of music in society and the, and the situation of artists, you know, the role of music and the situation of artists ain't so great. But anyway, so I used to, I started as a, as a performer because, uh, because I did. I don't know, you know, that's the role. And both, I started in the theater and as an actor and then went as a playwright and then I went into music and I went and did the same progression. And we were talking earlier that it, it, it's as a performer, I felt one of the reasons, one of the things that I luxuriated in as a performer is that I wasn't as revealing as I was. I, I didn't want to be a writer or a composer because then I'd show my whole, you know, neurotic, uh, vain, obsessional, whatever I wanted to call myself, self. Uh, it, it, as a performer, I had this, I, I kept in my mind this little privacy area that I could that I could hide behind just trying to realize the work of some other vain, obsessional creature that I was, um, whose work I was realizing. Um, and so you guys were both performers too, before you bit the bullet. And Absolutely. Did, did you, how did, <coughs> we, did you always want to do composing and performing was just along the road or? I enjoyed both. I was a team player, so I really enjoyed playing in an orchestra on bass clarinet. I was also a pianist, <coughs> which is not something that is something you more do at home, usually not in ensembles. But um, as a performer, it allowed me to play so many different types of music that it was a great education. Mm -hmm. I mean, I played everything from Dixieland to modern jazz, um, everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John? Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask Benita how you came to do all this performing. How did you start out? Um, I started out on piano when I was about eight or nine, and uh -huh. I taught myself. And um, then eventually I had lessons. When I went to the first lesson, <laughs> the teacher gets out the elementary book, and <laughs> she shows it to me. And I'm like, well, you know, I can play that. I know how to play two hands together. <laughs> I was eight or nine years old. She didn't believe me, but she picked, picked out another book where it was like both hands together. And I played it. But the funny thing was that I had been like learning from the book. So the book said you should count the beats and you should tap your foot. So I was like playing the music, counting, tapping my foot and counting out loud all at the same time. And I had no conception really of what a pianist did. I had never like really seen a pianist perform or anything. How but did you come across uh, this book? We and got this old piano. We got this book. old piano, and in the bench were like instruction books, <laughs> oh, and they I had see. theory, and they had everything. So I just started going through all of them. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> you play a little <laughs> piano, yeah. right? Yeah, I had piano lessons from uh, from age eight. Yeah. Mm. Why did you start playing the piano? <laughs> well, uh, because I was advised to, to do so. What actually happened was I went to a movie. Uh, uh, about a young musician. It was called Young Man with a Horn. Oh, I know that movie. You know that movie? Yeah. It's a great movie. And, and uh, I, I, uh, after I saw the movie, I was so inspired, I ran home and told my mother I wanted to play the trumpet. So she, uh, uh, this was a, going to be a fi an investment. So she thought, perhaps I should be tested. For, so she took me <laughs> to a private music school and they gave me a music test, sort of an ear test. And, the, the man who gave me the test uh, uh, advised me and my mother that I should learn the piano instead of the trumpet. Of course, I was disappointed, but okay, I got piano lessons, and that's how that started. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a city that was Madison, Wisconsin, 
<laughs> so much music happens in that city. It's no just kidding. unbelievable. Mm. Of every type and every variety, and there are so many good musicians. The school system, I mean, just turns out good musicians. Mm. In those days, we had excellent programs. Uh, we had the Wisconsin Youth Symphony Orchestra. We had uh, everybody was like sort of feeding the students into the university, mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> we had um, and. I can tell you the high school I went to had extremely high standards to get into the top groups. I mean, you had to pay all your scales in under th 30 seconds, all of them, tonguing them, all 12, and things like that. Good heavens. <laughs> 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 what did that sound like? <laughs> 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 One of the things we were, one of the things that we we had also been talking about before the show started was this this this, this other idea of the role of music and and the role of art in American society, the kind of, uh, 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 I mean, if we're this is my this is my mantra actually, if we're surrounded by art all the time, like this table, you know, I mean somebody mm -hmm. made this thing, and. Um, it's it, the quality of these expressions, the quality of this art, the quality of the music that you're feeding into your brains. This was the term I used before, right? That you're, I mean, in, in the way that, that um, let me just read you this thing that Jimmy Baldwin wrote about writers. Writers are extremely important people in the country, whether or not the country knows it. <laughs> the multiple truths about a people that are revealed by a people's artists that is what artists are for, um, and if 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 the and, and I don't know that this was less true in any other point in history. If the if the if the multitude of art and artists that people are exposed to are not showing them a variety of perspectives, they're in fact you know hying to some party line, uh, to some conventional line, rather than opening doors or you know, really, you know, like when you have a really good convers those rare occasions when you have a really good conversation with somebody and it's exciting, you know, it's, it's really you, I mean, to me, I, I, art, I want art to, I want to be changed by it. I want to leave it different rather than it just sort of like pulling fleas out of my head, you know, <laughs> and I'm pulling fleas out of its head, you know, it's, it's it, rather than it just making me, um, although I like that kind too, I like to veg, but it, it has bad, effects on me too. So the role of music in, in any society, the I don't know any other way to put it. I'm not getting very far with this. The the the, the yeah. Well um I did an interview a year ago on the uh, new music uh, box dot org mm -hmm. and at the end of the interview I said something that uh, I really feel that music represents more about human experience than any other art. And that sometime in the future when mankind is gone, someone comes to our planet and they want to know what we're human beings like, they're going to find out about this more in our music than anything else. Why do, why do you think that? Well, that? because the emotions are just so there all the time. And it's done in time, and it leads you through experiences. If you look at a, a painting, now a great painting will sort of lead you around the canvas too, but it's still um, not the same. It's not as real as what happens when you hear sound. <coughs> well, your music is your vibration. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no way you can hide it. It's you make music. That's what your vibration is, as, as we used to say in the 60s. And you mean you, you the person who's making the music, that's your vibration. And so yes. people, are, people uh, are listening to your vibration. You can't. People are getting your vibes, as we say. But, but when those vibes are all conventionalized and, and uh, da 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 da, oh, well, that's, not a, that's a good convention. <laughs> but that's perhaps not <laughs> but, the best uh, example. Uh, it's not the best example. Um, <laughs> Da, 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 da. I don't know, you know, happy birthday to you, da 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 da. When, when, they're, when they're predictable and um, 
I don't know. I, let me just throw something else out at you. I, I, I read a, a, a thing that Noam Chomsky, the linguist, uh, among other things, said that ordinary people use language in in um, creative ways all the time, and I, I, that surprised me actually, because um, I, I, I mean. It, I find it so difficult these 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 these, these endlessly jive um, um, music and and um, imitation music imitation. Well, I, I I find it stultifying, and I I I, I it, it 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 makes me angry when I become you know aware of it that it's stultifying me, or uh, and. Um, I think one of uh, one of the words that you used was um, predictability, essentially. That when you're listening to something and you know what's coming <coughs> up, it takes away the mystery for you. And when the mystery's taken away, it doesn't even feel like art in a way because the mechanism is exposed. Mm -hmm. And so when you think feel like you can uh, predict what's going to happen next. Um, that ability to predict, for me, takes away the mystery. And so anytime I can understand how something was made, I'm not very interested in it. I'm more interested in the things that I can't understand how they were made. <laughs> that fascinates me. Hmm. I have trouble with that predictability thing, too, because why is it that I can, I used to do this, play a piece by uh, sonata by Mozart 50 times and never get tired of it, even though I know exactly what's coming. The mystery remains anyway. Somehow I have to separate mystery and predictability. <laughs> well, you know, Mozart is a really good example because um, his music has been played so many times by so many people in so many slap-happy ways that we forget how actually unusual it is. And if you sit down and you look at a, a, a sonata or any kind of piano piece by Mozart, you will, and you look from measure to measure, and you ask yourself, why did he jump to this? Why did he go to this? Why did he go to that? It really doesn't make sense. <laughs> and yet everybody plays it like it makes sense. Hmm. But they're not listening to what they're doing. They're just pushing the keys down. If they really like listened and said, why should this section come after that? There's so much of that in Mozart. It's really, it's kind of almost insane in a way. And it's more insane that people play it like it's normal, <laughs> you know? Mm. Which doesn't explain why the mystery remains, even though you know what's going to happen. Yeah, but, but you sort of <laughs> don't because it doesn't really happen in, in the way you, you, you would predict it. I mm. mean, you do know That's you true. It, know. it doesn't happen a way that you would predict yeah. it. I, I can I can follow that. Yeah. And maybe the conversation yeah. is in a way. Uh, maybe the conversation not in a way. Maybe the conversation is 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 intelligent <coughs> enough. The conversation that he's having with you, the, the 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 questions that he's asking, the ideas that he's that you know, formulating in this abstract musical way, that that it's it's endlessly interesting because it's. Because it, because he's really talking to you. It's really, really. I mean, this was something we talked about one time. They did, they did some studies, I think, in Canada, where uh, people in nursing homes, the people who were, you know, at the end of their life, and you know, either they had Alzheimer's or being in the nursing home made them have Alzheimer's. I used to work in a nursing home, and we used to have to do intake within 48 hours because people would change so dramatically. You may not get any information from them. They would go into <laughs> such deep depressions. Mm. And in these, in these, it's terrible. And in these day rooms, in order to keep them quieter, a lot of places in the United States will just play this horrible pop music that has nothing to do with the it had it, the people in the room that you know wasn't their pop music, and and besides which it's so caustic. And um, but when they play Mozart or Beethoven or something else that, that it's a more complex music, the people in the room, the, the, the blood pressure goes down, they, they quiet down, even though they may be people who never listened to this music in their adult life, they never played any of oh, that kind of music. But my theory 
okay. for what it's worth, is that there's something to hold on to. There's something to actually listen to. There's a, there's a, there's a uh, um, rather than this kind of battering ram against your head, you know, whether it be a, a kind of gentle, soft rock battering ram, you know, where the dynamic level stays the same, and that ought to calm them down, but it doesn't. Mm. It's this, it's this other thing where they can, where the, where there's a, a a serious, and I guess in a way friendly, <laughs> communique, you know, that's going on. Uh, when somebody spent a lot of time, you know, composing this communique, or, you know, whatever time it took them, uh, and that that has real uh, value, and it seems to have value to, you know, I mean, they, they, they certainly play that kind of music when they want, in big public spaces, when they want to keep the, the public calm. I think, mm. you know, with Mozart or any of the classical composers, there was sort of a balance of right brain, left brain stuff. And when that happens, that does calm people down. It has a calming effect. And, um, <coughs> um, but I think even if they played, I mean, I, I think, I mean, even if they played Feldman or Marcus um, or McGuire, that it would be interesting enough I'm sitting in this damn day room, you know, in this horrible situation, just waiting for the next person to push me around and the next danger to, you know, to have to overcome. Uh, and, and, you know, that it's, somebody's really talking to me, you know, in whatever lingo, they're really talking to me and I can, I can feel it. I can, you know, it, it, I can get involved in it like I could if I, looks at a tree or uh, you know I mean it's, a tree is pretty interesting mm -hmm. I mean you can just look at it just keep on looking at it I mean it's this it's not a false move on the tree <laughs> um, so I you know I well I think one of the things is the idea about um, there's music that's entertainment, and there's music that serves other purposes. Now, and the music I consider entertainment would be things like dance music or popular song or something like that, although certainly popular song can rise to the level of yes. art music, too. Um, but then there's sort of art music, what we might want to call it. Um, and when we take any uh, composer, uh, to me, part of the measure of the composer is to what degree they're really being honest about what they're doing. And, um, let's see. Um, I think honesty is a really important part of the, of the or, or central, or, you know, the axis of, upon which everything floweth, you know. I mean, if you want to write a mysterious piece, it has to be mysterious to you as the composer. If it's not mysterious to you, it's not really going to go over with the audience. When I mean, you really have to, you know, scare yourself. And if you're not scaring yourself in your own music, then uh, how do you expect to scare the audience? That Can you give an example of scaring yourself when you write music? I'm not quite familiar with this concept. Um, I, I, I remember reading in a book about the photographer uh, Diane Arbus that one of the mm -hmm. assignments she liked to give was to take a picture of somebody you're afraid of. Mm -hmm. Is it something like that? Yes, actually it is a lot like that mm -hmm. because um, we were talking earlier about censoring our music and uh, to a large degree I don't censor my music as it's being written. Uh, sometimes I set up um, things ahead of time that will limit my where I'm going to go with it and that's a type of censorship but when the music is coming to me I write it down I think of myself as a scribe more than a composer because I listen I go into like a, a very meditative state <coughs> and I let sound come to me and I'm sort of a channeler I do really let it just flow through me a very natural way and when I hear it um, I write it down, and I, then I go to the next section and write that down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens in the process is that sometimes I write music that I don't like, 
or I write music that scares me. And, and rather than editing and taking it out because it displeases me for some reason, I, I think more in terms of the composition and say, well, the music is saying this. The music needs to say this. It's <coughs> not my role to censor it. It's my role just to get it out there to the public. And um, I know that isn't the situation with a lot of composers or even a lot of artists. I used to work with um, Francesco Clemente, who was a painter, and uh, we did a concert series and we were good friends for many, many years. And I watched him paint all the time. And he would do some absolutely gorgeous paintings. But when it got time to mount the show, he would destroy the beautiful paintings and only put up the ones that he felt the public wanted to see. And I felt, I, and I would argue with him, I would say, you know, you, I don't think you should be censoring your own work this way. Because the thing that you weren't seeing about his, his work was some of the most beautiful things there. His love for his children, his love for women, a kind of delicacy, things like that, which you, in, you know, to me was absolutely gorgeous. And I would hate to see when I'd come in, he literally would rip these canvases up into little pieces. Mm. You think it's because he was afraid of them somehow, or? You know, I always thought it was <laughs> the fact that he had a European background and he sort of felt like he, he had to like, build on the history of his background. Mm. And we don't have that feeling here, fortunately. I, I, one of the things I, one of the gauges I use, and it really makes me so uncomfortable when I actually get there, but it's the gauge, and it's a word you used before. If I'm doing something that embarrasses me, mm -hmm. I think that I have done good work. Well, but it's such a creepy feeling. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, and, and it lasts, you know, like it, 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 it diminishes over a period of time, and especially post a performance, if I've done something. Uh, I, and, and anyway, and so, it, it, so not just in the privacy of my room, but other people have seen it. Um, but I think what that means is that I've, I've, I've left the, my, my, my comfortable conventions. Mm -hmm. I've left them behind. And I've moved, I've made a move, you know, into a better, into a new place uh, that discomforts me. And, and, and I, so, but it's, it's hard <laughs> to, to, to get myself to do that, even though that's my, you know, that's, that's what I'm reaching for. That's my, you know, that's the hand of whatever. And um, can I, can I tell a truth that, that dissembles me? Um, <coughs> enough so that I'm I'm off balance. Well, perhaps you could al also say that you're, you're you, you might dislike something you've done because you feel it's not truthful. And I've done a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, or or you know like full of it's not truthful in the sense that it's half truths mm -hmm. or you know a quarter truths and and um, actually I'm doing a series right after this. A music show, and I'm calling it "How I Became a Coward," and I'm delineating <laughs> these ways in which I um, have have um, been cowardly, and how they have um, this is what I'm trying to do anyway, built on one another to create some grander coward, um, some grander cowardly moment. Um, so um, I'm, uh, I, you know, it, it seems to me that that the that the that that's <coughs> one of the the lines in the sand between, um, what can I say, good art, honest art, and not so honest art, you know, more conventional art, is that it's, it's the, the and you, you, the, the conventional artist is, is, is in, rel and there's a lot less jeopardy, a lot less, um, a lot less exposed. Uh, or feels less exposed, and that's the whole. Um, that's its appeal, and and that's what you can buy. Like you can't, you can buy. I was watching. I watch a lot of movies. You can buy a lot of technique. You can buy a lot of uh, technical skill, but you can't buy. Uh, you can't buy good art. 
or at least what I, what I would call good art. You can't uh, just, <coughs> you can buy stuff that looks really sleek and, and you know, but still it's, 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 it's vacuous in the way that uh, higher quality stuff, and you know, these are all subjective terms, but real ones, now we've got two minutes. Real ones, um, nonetheless, I, I just, I remember watching this movie about, um, I think it was this Impressionist or something, it was a Hollywood movie, and, and they, they, they're they painting like crazy and <laughs> getting ready for the big show, you know, and, and, and this Hollywood version of what they're doing, and it was absurd if, if, if you've ever, you know, been an artist, and, but what was really telling was that the paintings that they used, and they were using paintings, you know, as famous artists, they were terrible imitations of what they did. They were really ghastly imitations, and I thought, Thank, in a way, thank goodness that these Holly, the people who made this movie had such lousy taste that they <laughs> made the movie and they stuck this imitation, you know, Matisse up there, and it was so badly done. I mean, they could have gotten something better than that, but they didn't have the eyes for it, or or they didn't pick up the phone to the right, you know, the right connection to it, or something, and they, um, and so they helped us. They helped us to to understand and one of the things that happens here is we get this countdown the gentleman behind the camera is giving me the countdown for the one minute the one minute is and I don't you know you're composers I'm a composer too and as I do this show I'm thinking what is one minute for goodness sake I can't tie one up minute the, is a long it's period a, it's of a time. long time right it's Absolutely. a long time it seems it depends it, on the context doesn't it <laughs> I've well, heard I mean, composers say it's nothing I've heard somebody oh. else say it's nothing Oh, I don't know. Sixty yeah. seconds. It's a long and so time. That was thirty seconds, and and that's that's something that mm. certainly is um, music's metier is is the is is time. If 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 for painting, it's space. Uh, for music, um, playing with playing with time, and so here we are. And so I I want to thank you both, and we're going out, and we'll be back.